All right, well, Ezekiel chapter 13 is a chapter where we're going to learn about uh, Ezekiel confronting false prophets and dealing with them. So we can think of this similar to when Jeremiah approached the false prophets and talked with them as well in Jerusalem. But of course, these are the false prophets in Babylon, in the exiled group up there, basically. Uh, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. So he's going to go against these prophets. That Everybody's listening to these prophets. The prophets are telling them, oh, this isn't bad. We're going to be okay. We're going to be, you know, there's going to be a revolt. Babylon's going to be destroyed. We're going to be let go here pretty soon. You know, Jehoiachin's going to go back to rule in Jerusalem. It'll all be fine. We'll be great. No problems. Uh, that's the false prophets. Now verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have been have seen nothing. So this is saying basically the false prophets are following their own ideas. They're not following what God has, taught, has shown them. Even though they're claiming, God showed me these things, God's going, Nope, I didn't show you none of that stuff, basically. And the Old Testament study manual said, It is common among the people of the world to reject the words of true prophets and accept the words of false ones. Such is the easy way in the beginning, for it allows people to accept only that which they want to hear. It is, however, the path to destruction. False prophets path pacify and lull people into carnal security. Like the cunning foxes in the desert... They obtain their prey subtly. False prophets have not provided for the people a secure defense against spiritual destruction. Compare, uh, Ezekiel compared the work of false prophets to daubing a wall with untempered mortar. So you're trying to fix a wall with the stuff that's not going to fix it. It just makes it look like it's fixed, but it isn't really fixed. Uh, so continuing on with this, uh, verse 4, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. So again, basically saying, look, the people are, the, the prophets are claiming, God sent me to give this message to you. And God's going, I did not say that. That's not what I said at all. So, but the people are like, oh, we really hope this is good. This is going to make us feel good. We hope this is the real word of God, but they're not trying it. They're not testing it. They're not proving it out. Um, so verse seven, have ye not seen a vain vision and have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. So again, you're claiming you're having these visions from me. I didn't give you any vision. Verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. So they're claiming they're going back. And Ezekiel's going, God said, you're not going back because you are false prophets. Verse 10, because even because they have seduced my people saying peace and there was no peace and one built up a wall and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. So if you haven't tempered it, if it's not ready to go, it's not going to set up. You're going to have a false wall. It will crumble easily on you. Uh, in fact, uh, Freeman, in his um, Manners and Customs of the Bible, mentions this. This metaphor is used a lot in this chapter to daub is to plaster it or get it spread everywhere. It looks like sound structure, but is weak inside, whitewashing things. Made good, and it's made good, bad, and bad good. Change perceptions. Untempered means it is not mixed property to be strong. It is weak. Kitto is of the opinion that reference is here made to cob walls, that is, walls which are made of beaten earth, rammed into molds or boxes to give shape and consistence, 
and then emptied from the molds layer by layer on the wall where it dries as the work goes on. Such walls cannot stand the effects of the weather and houses built on this principle soon crumble and decay. To protect them from the weather, a very fine mortar is sometimes made, which is laid thickly on the outside of the walls. When this mortar is properly mixed with lime, it answers the purpose designed. But where the lime is left out, as is often the case, the untempered mortar is no protection. Some commentators, however, translate tafel, which in our version is rendered untempered mortar, by the word whitewash. They represent the idea of the text to be the figure of a wall unendurable material, and coated not with cement which might protect it, but with a mere thin covering of lime which gives the wall a finished durable appearance which its real character does not warrant. So it's fake. The, the prophets are, look like they're building a true wall, but it's fake. They're just putting a plaster on it, making it look good. It's the lipstick on the pig idea. Basically, it's fake. So verse 11, Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and the stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? So again, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to build this wall. Oh yeah, the, these are the these prophets are great. They're amazing. They're they're doing true work, but it's fake. It's hollow. When the hard times come, that wall is going to crumble and crash, and they're going to go. What happened? Why didn't it stand up? We don't know what's going on. It's fake prophets. They fall. They stumble. They have that their prophecies don't come true. Basically, that's the problem that they're going to run into. So verse thirteen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So we could think of even just the wall of Jerusalem coming down, kind of metaphorically with this, but even think, you know, the Babylon's army is just going to utterly wipe out the, the tribe of Judah, basically, through this. Uh, verse 14, so will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. So just because these prophets are calling for peace doesn't mean they're real prophets. They're not following the word of God, basically. There's a difference. The message, just because the message sounds like a previous message, doesn't mean it's the right message. It needs to be the correct message. And we know this through following promptings of God. When we live our life where we are close to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can help us confirm truth of revelation. There is no revelations God gives to his prophets. He doesn't give the rest of us. But we have to be willing to do the hard work to find that truth out and understand. That's what Nephi does. Whenever his dad has a vision, he goes and fasts and prays over it to understand the, the interpretation of it. Because he wants to understand. He's seeking the Spirit in his life to help him. That's what we need to be doing in our life. When we hear the prophet speak, we should be praying and pondering over their words to under and asking God to help us understand, what does this mean for me? What do I need to do with this? And as we do that, the Spirit can confirm truth to us. We don't just sit and listen to it on the over the pulpit or on the TV or on the radios or podcasts or social media or anything. We don't just sit and listen. That's nice. But what we need to do is actively work at understanding the message. That will help us so much more. So, okay, continuing on here, verse 17. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. So they have prophetess, false prophets and prophetesses, speaking to Israel, basically. Men and women who claim to be prophets of God and have that authority to speak in the name of God. They're, they're, they're all false, though. 
Verse 18, and say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people and will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? So let's look at this. Let's break this down, what he's saying in verse 18, because it sounds kind of strange. So woe to the women. These are the prophetesses that are false that sew pillows to armholes. Now, others translate pillows to be sewing magic amulets onto clothes. They're sewing amulets. They're putting these symbols, these gems and things on them, claiming they have, they give them power. And make kerchiefs. Okay, another translation is they make veils of various lengths to ensnare the people. Upon the head of every stature. Now, the word pillows would be better translated as bands or coverings. The kerchief was a kind of veil used as part of the trappings in the magical arts. That's from the Interpreter's Bible. So they're, they're, they're getting into mystical, magical things, talismans and, and things that they believe have power of themselves to give. If I have this with me, it gives me power. If I put this bracelet on, it gives me power, kind of an idea. So, I mean, if you think about it, they're creating charms. Lucky charms to imbue them with, own, with with power and things of themselves, basically, to ward off. They're trying to do this to ward off the evil. That is, oh, we're going to avoid all the evil and bad and destructions that you're talking about, Ezekiel, because we're using these charms to have magical powers to help us to help us out. We're using the these charms, these rocks and these stones can help repel evil spirits and evil divinations, and we're going to change our own fortune with our own talismans, and that's not how it works, guys. It's not, not what really goes on here. Uh, now, Ezekiel prophesied against women who, by divination, led people away from God and gave them a false sense of security. They brought destruction upon those who might otherwise live and spiritually and held up and sustained those who ought to have been condemned. They promised prosperity and freedom, which they could not deliver. It's from the Old Testament study manual. Now, it's interesting the priests, the false men, claim authority from God that is wrong. The false women aren't claiming authority from God necessarily, but claim they are using worldly things that have imbued power of themselves, so a substitute to the power of God that they're using to combat against the will of God. God's saying, you're going to be destroyed, and they're going, no, we're going to use our divination, these mystical powers and mystical things of the world, the energy of the world to change our fortunes. We can, we can get around God's judgment if we use enough worldly power to do it. That's what's happening. And this, uh, this stuff happens in today's world. There are substitutes to the real power of God. There are people who claim to have the power of God, but don't. Be careful. There is nothing the priesthood needs outside of a willing person. That's it. If you have faith in God and you keep your covenants with him, you have priesthood power. It's that simple. You don't need an object to give you any divination or extra power or anything. So these are some of the, you can see some of the problems and challenges that uh, these people had at this time. Now, verse 19, And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live? By your lying to my people that hear your lies. Now this is them selectively picking who wins and who loses. Basically. You're going to pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and pieces of bread. You're going to convince the people to sustain you at their expense. So that they die from starvation and you live. When in fact you should be the one dying and they should be the ones living. They're just trying to truly follow God, and you're leading them astray. Basically, that's what, that was what uh, verse 19 is about. So verse 20, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, or your talismans and charms, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt, to make them fly. So this is the idea of, I'm going to, Take these people who you're trying to trick into believing you're actually doing something, and I'm going to help them to see the truth and to have 
more agency and freedom to move. Your kerchiefs, the, the, the veils that you're using, well, also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. Ye shall know that I am the Lord, because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way, by promising him life. You're telling the wicked, we'll save your life if you invest in us. And the righteous are going, but we, we're trying to do, no, no, kill them, they're bad. This is that reversal of perspective. Verse 23, therefore ye shall see no more vanity, nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So these false people, the false prophets and prophetesses, gone. They're not going to be able to do their work anymore. They will be destroyed and they'll be gone in ancient Israel, basically. So a lot of changes and challenges coming for them. Uh, good advice for us today. To, if we follow the wrong people, we can be in a lot of trouble. So make sure we are truly following God, which should be a personal relationship with him. That's how we know we're following God. We worry about following God ourselves, not following through somebody else. Follow him personally. Get to know him personally is the most important part of it all. Well, let's jump over to our next chapter to continue on with Ezekiel.